Good morning, everybody. Why don't you guys stand? We'll worship together.
righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And I trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the same. Kindness 
Father, there's just something beautiful about just a group coming together and singing to you. It doesn't have to be music. It doesn't have to be instruments. It doesn't have to be any of that. It's just these words that speak so much truth that we're not doing anything for it to speak more truth. It's already there. And we thank you for songs just like that that give us this constant reminder that you are so good. In the midst of all our craziness of life, just things that are going on that we couldn't foresee that we've never experienced before, God, we know that you have. And I just pray that you're with every single person here. God, as we dive into your word now, God, that we would leave this place with the message that speaks your truth, that we would see you for who you are and how much you love every single person in this room. We thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Ryan. Well, we're studying the book of 1 John, if you're new here today. And uh, we're in chapter 2. We left off at verse 18. Um, I already hear, hear the bells going off. Uh, do you see that word, Antichrist? <laughs> okay, here it comes. You're going to see. Phones are going to go off. People are going to walk around. They're going to stand up and yell at me. Uh, there's going to be some kind of distraction, all right? <clears throat> because when you talk about the spirit of the Antichrist, that spirit fights back and wants you to be distracted. If there are distractions, just stay focused. Stay focused and have ears to hear what the Word of God says. 1 John is not a book for everyone. 1 John is a book for committed Christians. Actually, it's a book for genuine Christians. John is not mad at us. He's not mad at Christians. He's very passionate about what he says in this book. We've already seen John says that Christians, we should be known by our light. We should be known by our love. And now recently he's saying we should be known by our truth. Christians live by the truth. Um, Nathaniel talked to us last Sunday about it, how John said, hey, I'm writing to you fathers, you young sons, you children. You're my children. You're my spiritual children. John is an old man. And he's saying, I have compassion for you spiritual children. And I want you to see these things. They are so important for the church. And now today, he starts warning us about antichrists. So I want to read the first verse where we left off and introduce it. 1 John 2, 18. Again, he says, children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard, that antichrist is coming. That should be a capital A. So now many antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. I think you know we live in a world full of phonies, full of ripoffs, con artists. Some of these scams are, being, are getting very good. Recently, people that I'm close to you hear about being scammed. The scams are getting good. Technology is increasing. The book of Daniel, the prophet Daniel, way back thousands of years ago, warned that in the last days, he said, people are going to go to and fro and knowledge are going to increase. Travel is going to change. 
And people are going to go all over the place in cars and airplanes. And technology is going to increase as we come to the end. And we know that the Bible tells us not technology is not evil in itself. But we know the coming Antichrist is going to use technology to control people. When John says... It is the last hour. Skeptics say, John says it's the last hour. Well, he said that over 2,000 years ago. That hour has come and gone. Well, it's a figure of speech. What John's saying is it's the last hour. It is the fourth quarter. It is the fourth quarter. And time is ticking out. God has chosen not to show us the, the, how much time is on the clock. We don't know. Nobody knows the day. Nobody knows the hour. God likes it that way because he wants to keep us alert and he wants to keep us ready. But approaching 2,020, how many more grains are in God's hourglass of time before the end comes? Peter says it this way. He says, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. And they will say, where is this promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. Peter says, be ready in the last days, because antichrists, those who are against Christ, are going to come. And they're going to scoff at the second coming of Jesus Christ, the rapture of the church. They're going to say, where is it? And and then down in verse 8, he says this, But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. That's saying God's not bound by time. To to finite people, it's been over a thousand years since John wrote this. To God, how long has it been? A couple hours? A couple minutes? He transcends time. And God is a patient God, and God is patient allowing his gospel to spread before the end finally comes. But Peter goes on to say in that chapter, but it's going to come like a thief. People are not going to be ready for it. In other words, it's finally going to happen. And I know we talk about it here at Freedom, and we went through it in Mark's gospel. We're going through Revelation, so we're talking about it. We, we t- but I think sometimes the more we talk about it, the more we kind of get used to it and like, well, is it really going to happen today? Is it really going to happen this year? And we can't think that way. We have to always be ready. God is always reminding it, it's going to happen. Get yourself ready for Jesus to take people off this planet. Get your family ready because everything in our world is set up for it. Now, John says that the Antichrist that I said should be capital A is coming, but then he says there have many Antichrists that have come. Yeah, the ultimate big Antichrist is coming in the end, but there's a spirit of the Antichrist that's in the world today, and there are many Antichrists in our world today. They could be big, they could be small. Um, There could be a guy in the pulpit today. He's got a church of 20,000 people. He could be an antichrist. There could be another church that just has 30 or 40 people in it, and the custodian or a Sunday school teacher is an antichrist, where they're teaching things that are not the truth of Scripture, and they are replacing Jesus Christ with something else. That's what Antichrist means. See, 
you get this idea out of your mind that the Antichrist is a monster. And, and everybody in the world points out the person they hate in the world of politics, and they say that person is the Antichrist because they don't like him. And whatever side you're on, you pick somebody out and say that's the Antichrist. And I want to ask you something. How can somebody be, in the, be the Antichrist when all the, people, well, when all the evil people in the world hate him? They can't be. And you've got to understand the Antichrist is the ultimate wolf in sheep's clothing. Antichrist is a, is a deceiver. Antichrist acts like he's got Christian or religion and deceives people. Uh, let's say there's a guy you know, and he tells you, he says, you know, you invite him to church. Why don't you, would you like to come, I would like you to come visit my church. And he says, what kind of church is it? And you say, oh, it's a non-denominational, just a Bible-believing Christian church. And he says to you, well, you know, I really don't believe that I need the Jesus stuff that the Bible teaches. He says, you know, I feel that I'm a good person and I don't hurt anybody. I do community service, but I don't need Jesus Christ to forgive my sin. Okay, that person that says that is an antichrist. Why? Because they are replacing Jesus Christ, the truth of Jesus Christ, with something else. That person is trusting in their own human goodness to get them to God instead of Jesus Christ. Therefore, they are antichrist. They're replacing Christ with something else, and they'll tell others that to accept their belief system. So understand, antichrist, antichrists are everywhere. Like I said, they're in pulpits. They're in your neighborhood, they're in your family, they're at your work, they're everywhere, and John is, is pleading with his children in the church to be aware of this and not to be deceived by them. Now, the ultimate Antichrist to come, Daniel talked about him. Daniel talked about how ferocious he would be. Daniel talks about how he will take control of the world. He will break the world into pieces, he says in Daniel 7. His kingdom will come, and people will fall for it. Jesus talked about the Antichrist um, in Matthew 24, and he talked about this man that would come that would commit the abomination of desolations. He's going to, again, he'll be the ultimate wolf in sheep's clothing. He is going to deceive the world, and everybody's going to think he's solving all the world's problems. But then he's going to set himself up as God and demand to be worshipped, much like the Caesars did. They, they had this great Roman Empire, and the people admired him, but then it got to the place where they wanted to be worshipped. But this is going to be... This is where the world is headed, and it's all being set up for it. You are going to hear it in 2020. You're going to hear antichrist statements from politicians, from religious leaders. It is growing by leaps and bounds, and it is ready to take the world by storm. Paul talked about the, the antichrist. He called him the man of lawlessness, the man of sin. Paul goes into a little bit of specifics. I want to read from 2 Thessalonians 2. He says, The coming of the lawless one is won by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. What's the truth? Jesus said, I am the way and the truth. Paul says people refuse to love that, so they're going to be deceived, and they're going to perish because they refuse to love that truth. So they're going to be deceived by the Antichrist. Verse 11, therefore God sends them a strong delusion 
so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. In other words, it's a judgment of God. When the Antichrist comes, it's a judgment of God. God is saying, you didn't want my son Jesus Christ who came on that first Christmas, who took on a human body, who showed you what God was like, and then he went and died on that cross in your place. He rose again from the dead to prove. We've got authenticated history book scriptures to give us the truth, but you didn't want it. So you didn't want Jesus Christ, so, the, what, so God says you're going to get the ultimate antichrist. And notice how it says... God sends them a strong delusion. Some of you think there is no way in this world, this world is way too divided by politics, by the vast religions, by the vast empires and countries and different cultures and different beliefs. There is no way one man can come and unite everybody. You underestimate the power of God because it says God is going to send the delusion. God is going to send the blindness. Let's just imagine for a moment. Let's imagine for a moment that this rapture of the church we've been talking about in our study of Revelation, the rapture, 1 Thessalonians 4, when Christ comes to take his church, and then it begins the wrath of God, the judgment that includes the Antichrist. People, people get misguided on it because they don't think the Antichrist is part of the wrath, but it is. Clearly, well, I just read it. Um, imagine that the Christians disappear from this planet today. Do you think it might cause a little bit of world chaos if people just disappear? Do you think it'll cause chaos when children disappear and they're gone? Where did they go? (laughs) What is the Antichrist? What are the people of the world? What is he going to say? We don't know, but whatever lie he comes up with, people are going to believe it. And when this happens, it's going to unite everybody. The first part of... 2 Thessalonians 2, look about it. It says that God is restraining the world so the spirit of the Antichrist can't take over right now. If God wasn't restraining it, it would absolutely take control. Why is God restraining it? So he can preach his gospel. So he can preach the gospel. He's keeping it from getting out of control so people can hear the gospel and be saved. But once he takes his church, once the last sheep comes home, God's going to take the restraint off, God's going to send a powerful delusion, and everybody's going to believe the lie. And they're going to have such a great fear that they're going to flock to answers. And then this guy's going to come on the scene, and he's going to have all the answers. You know, the the devil's the ultimate deceiver, folks. All of the problems in our world today, do you know who's behind it? The devil. And guess who's going to come riding in on a white horse to fix it all? The devil. In the purpose, in the person of the Antichrist, it's coming. The world is being set up for it. Um, John, John talks about the Antichrist, but he doesn't give any detail. Why doesn't he give any detail? Why is there so little detail about the Antichrist? Because we don't have to worry about the Antichrist. We're not going to be here. We're looking for Jesus Christ, not the Antichrist, if you read your New Testament correctly. And John's going to say in the next chapter, that's what keeps us a purified life. He goes into the next chapter after he talks about Antichrist in to look for Christ, to have the hope of Christ. So we don't need to be alarmed. We don't need to be like Chicken Little don't, don't leave church saying, oh, my, pastor talked about the Antichrist. Relax. <laughs> Jesus is coming. This is what John's saying. Dear children, you're not going to be deceived by it. Thank God you're in church today hearing the truth. 
You love the truth. You want to be saved. You're not somebody that hates the truth that's going to be deceived by the deception, are you? So just know that John is more concerned really in the church about the little antichrists. The big antichrist is coming. That's going to happen. God's sovereign over all of that. But right now, as Christians, what do we do about the antichrist? And how do we know, recognize antichrist? What do antichrists do? Well, I already explained to you, they try to replace Jesus with something else. Just some other belief system. Um, but specifically, let's notice what John says they do. Number one, first of all, they desert the church. Antichrist eventually will desert the church. 1 John 2.19. John says, talking about Antichrist, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. Wow. You know the debate about whether or not a Christian can lose their salvation? It's settled right here. John says, if somebody leaves the church, now listen, this isn't talking about leaving Freedom Bible Church and going to another church, okay? This is talking about somebody that leaves the body of Christ. Now, it's possible somebody could leave Freedom Bible Church, and then, you know, they go to another church, and they go to another church, and nothing just, nothing just pleases them, right? It's possible, but we'll let, God will sort all that out. But this is talking about somebody that leaves the church, leaves the teaching of Jesus Christ goes off on another teaching, replaces Jesus <clears throat> with something else. Um, Judas Iscariot, he was an antichrist. Judas Iscariot, a disciple of Jesus, walked with Jesus for three years. They made him the treasurer. Judas on the outside looked Christian. But at the end, we found out Judas did not love Jesus in his heart. He did not love Jesus for who he was and the truth that he said. Judas wanted Jesus to take over Rome and give him a job sitting on a throne. Judas was looking for his own power. He wanted Jesus to give him power. He wanted Jesus to make his life great. Do you know how many people come to church looking for Jesus to fix their life, to fix their marriage, to make their life better, to make their life great, and when it doesn't happen, they're out of here? What was their agenda? You see, the agenda, when you love Jesus Christ, you love his teaching. You love what he did for you. You love that he was God in a human body that died for your sin, and you follow him. And it's not about what he's going to do for you. It's about what you're going to do following him. That's a big difference. And that's why people don't last. Judas didn't last, and Jesus didn't say Judas lost his salvation. What did Jesus say about Judas? He made it clear. He was a devil from the beginning. He never knew Christ. He never loved Christ. And there are people that come to church and sit in a church, even in a Bible church like ours, that secretly in here, they don't love Christ. And what John says is eventually, they'll leave us. They'll leave us. John 8, 31, Jesus said, so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, 
if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. If you truly believe in me, if you have a transformed heart, if you really love me, you will continue in my teaching. It's just going to happen. That's the proof of it. That's what the book of 1 John is about. Matthew 24, 13, Jesus says, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. He's saying that those who love me, those who follow me, they will endure till the end. But those who are false, those who are not genuine, they won't endure. It's not your endurance that saves you. It's your endurance that proves you're saved. Understand this. Understand what I'm saying. It's not that you better hold on to Jesus because you might not make it. No, it's Jesus is holding on to you if you're truly his. He's going to make sure you make it. It's not about you making sure you endure. It's not about you making sure you make it. Jesus is going to make sure you make it if you're truly in him. But that's the question. Because then if you're truly in him, you have the Holy Spirit. You have the power that created the world living in you. And because of that power, you will endure to the end. Now, I want to say this. Um, you know, Peter, Peter talked about apostates, talked about those who leave the church um, and turn on Christ. And he said, he said they're like a dog that goes back to their vomit. They're like a pig that goes back to the mud. Now, what, is, what animal does God call Christians? We're sheep. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, they follow me. We're not a dog, we're not a pig. See, you could bring a pig in here and dress him up in a bow tie, you can give him a Bible, let him hold him, you can sit by him and pet him. Some people think he's cute. Some people think he's cute. And that pig, he could be so nice, and you could, he could be tame, and the people pet him, and he seems so lovable, and he seems so clean and nice. But I promise you, when he leaves church, if he sees a mud puddle, or if he sees some pig slop, he is going to jump right in there with that bow and tie. Because that's his true nature. That's his nature. So eventually, whatever your true nature is, that's where you're going to end up. Okay? Understand, again, Christians struggle. Christians, true Christians that are going to be in heaven, sometimes get away from the church. They sometimes wander. They sometimes fall into sin. They, they make mistakes, okay? The difference is the true Christian always comes crawling back. They really do. They always come back. I've seen it in, in all the years of my ministry. I've seen Christians go astray. I've seen them make mistakes. I've seen them do worldly things. I've seen some Christians come back on their deathbed. They regret it, yes. They wish they would have done things different. But they come back on their deathbed and they, they proclaim that Jesus is their Savior. I, I will encourage you, don't wait for that. Don't wait till you have to go up and be disciplined by God and be on your deathbed. But the truth is, if you're in Christ, even when you're faithless, He's going to remain faithful to you and you're coming back sooner or later. But the one that truly doesn't love Christ, they'll leave and they won't come back. That's the difference of true salvation. You know, there's, I don't know if you've ever read the story of Samson in the Bible. I was fascinated with Samson when I was a young boy. Samson, the strong man. Samson, who killed lions with his bare hand. Samson, who killed a thousand Philistine with a donkey jawbone. Samson, who was God's man, anointed by God, 
because the people, the Jewish people were praying for a deliverer. But Samson was a disobedient Christian. Samson disobeyed everything God told him to do. Samson was supposed to take a Nazarite vow. He was supposed to never cut his hair. That would set him apart, that he is a Nazarite set apart for God. He was never to go near wine. Jews drank wine, but a Nazarite had to stay away from it. He was never to go near a dead body, so he would not be contaminated. And it was a way God would set them apart as somebody being used by God. Samson broke all the rules. Samson went and killed a lion and then the, the body was dead and he went in there and grabbed the honey and ate it. Samson drank and partied with the Philistines. He went and took a Philistine wife. And then he had Delilah, a Philistine girlfriend. And sure enough, sure enough, she deceived him. He didn't listen to God. Samson ended up with all of his hair cut off and they gouged his eyes out. The hero of God, this is what the Antichrist of the world thought, and they put him in prison. But if you know the story, Samson had a true heart for God, even though he was disobedient. He had a heart for God, and he prayed for God's mercy, and he got out and he prayed, God, God, let me, let me one more time be used by you. And you know the story. He pushed the temple down on all the Philistines, but it also killed Samson too. And at the last moment of his life, Samson displayed true faith. It was in there. You really couldn't see it. He wasn't acting like it. But you read, read Hebrews 11, Samson's in there. Isn't that good news? Isn't that good news to know no matter how far a child of God wavers, they will come back to God guaranteed but do you really want to end up like Samson with your eyes gouged out in prison before you get your life right? That's the point, okay? Live for Jesus Christ. God wants to protect you from all that, protect you from all from that discipline. God wants to use you. God wants to make you into a successful spiritual Christian. Not successful in the worldly sense of money, but successful in your walk with Christ, that you walk in the light, that you walk in love, and that God uses you in the church to reach out to others and to help others. Antichrist will desert the church eventually. And number two, John says, Antichrist, they deny Christ. They deny the Christ. This is how you know an antichrist for sure right here. Watch this. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. He says, my children. He's saying, you have the Holy Spirit. You have this knowledge in you. You should know the truth. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. What does that mean, Christ? So I thought that was Jesus' last name. Uh, Christ is his title. It means he's the, to the Jews, he's Jesus the Messiah. We call him Jesus the Christ. He's Jesus the Savior. He's the one that God sent to forgive our sins and bring us to God. But Antichrist deny that. This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. Verse 23. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Now, do I have to tell you what no one means in the Greek? No one, in case you're curious. No one. No one who denies the Son, capital S. No one who denies God the Son. If you deny him by saying he's not God, if you deny him by saying he did not 
come in the flesh. If you fall into one of these cults and say, no, he's not the son. He's just a good teacher. He's just an angel. He's just a phantom. He's just a ghost. If you deny that God, the son, came in a human body to die for your sin, you don't have the father, meaning you don't have God. There's a lot of religions that say that they believe in one true God, but they deny the Son. Therefore, they don't get to that one true God who, when we know him, when we know God, we call him Father because we become children through the blood, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, that statement can get you in trouble. That statement can get my car blown up. That statement has got me more hate email than any other statement when I say Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. I have got belligerent emails that made me think I need a bulletproof vest on, seriously, next Sunday because the world hates it. Do you realize the hatred toward Jesus Christ in our world proves it true? If I got up here and tell you that Peter Pan was my savior, nobody would be angry about it. Everybody would leave and just laugh. Ha, 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 he believes in Peter Pan. <laughs> but if I say I believe in Jesus Christ and he's the only way to heaven, people foam at the mouth and want to kill you. It proves it true. It proves it. It true. Jesus said, if they hated me, they will hate you. And that's why all the persecution going on in our world today, that's why the hatred is growing toward fundamental Bible-believing churches that believe that Jesus Christ is the only way. And it's going to escalate. You watch. And it's going to get to the place where this sermon right here that's on Facebook, they're going to show it on the news. And that's going to get scary. So what do we do when that happens? Do you understand John's not saying anything different than Jesus said? And, and, and a lot of antichrists in the world, you're going to hear it. I always hear it in the political world and stuff, people quoting Jesus. And, and they lie. They lie. They take little quotes of Jesus, Jesus that fits their agenda but they don't take the whole truth of the gospel that Jesus clearly said he's the only way. Listen to what Jesus said in John 5. This is where John got this. John 5 says that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. Jesus is clearly saying, if you don't honor the Son, if you don't go through the Son, if you don't believe in the Son, if you don't embrace the Son and everything he said and the person that he claimed to be, Jesus said, if you don't believe in who I claim to be, you'll die in your sin. He told that to the Jews who believed in the true God. You don't believe in who I claim to be. Well, who did Jesus claim to be? Right after that, he said, I am. And they picked up stones to stone him. You know who I am is? That's God, okay? Who was speaking at the burning bush. Jesus says, I'm the God that was speaking from the burning bush. So, and you know, I just, people go, but, but. But Frank, these people are so sincere. They're so sincere in what they believe. And I just feel bad. They go door to door. And I know they tell lies about Jesus, but they just seem so sincere. And they're dedicated to it. Yeah, and I know. And you know the doctor that gave the person the wrong medicine that killed him? He was sincere too. He thought he was given the right medicine, but he made the mistake. And it killed him. I heard about a lady that got off the wrong train. They told her the wrong stop. She got off the train. She died. 
They were sincere. They thought they were telling her where she was supposed to get off. You can be sincere all you want, but it's still a lie. And physical death, it's nothing compared to spiritual death for all of eternity. So it's a very serious matter, okay? So finally, in closing, what should Christians do? What should Christians do? What do we need to do about these antichrists, this influence? Well, first off, we need to stay faithful. John says this. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. If you continue in this teaching, if you abide in the teaching of the Son and embrace the Son, you're going to get eternal life. It's not about anything that you do or don't do. It's because you embrace the Son. And you're going to receive eternal life. And the idea is there, what you've heard from the beginning, the truth that you heard from the beginning. Um, let me read from 2 Timothy. It kind of gives this flavor of what he means by from the beginning. But as for you... Paul writing to Timothy, young Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Talking about the scriptures, talking about the Old Testament. We know from 1 Timothy, Timothy Timothy's mother and grandmother taught him the scriptures as a young boy. And Paul says, Timothy, don't turn away from the scriptures. Don't, don't chase after something new. And then, then verse 16, all scripture is breathed out by God. It is profitable for teaching, reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may complete, equip for every good work. The scripture is the breath of God. Scripture is the voice of God. And what he's saying is, stick to that. You don't need anything new. Folks, anything new, anything new is false. Why John is writing this is important to know, and I mentioned it, but I want you to understand it. John is so passionate about this because in the early church, there was a cult called the Gnostics. The Gnostics are still around, folks. And the spirit of the Gnostics is still in a lot of the false religion out there today. And what the Gnostics, you know, were saying is they had this hidden secret knowledge that no one else had. And people in the church were fascinated by it, especially the younger believers. They were led astray by it because these Gnostics were saying, hey, no, we've got the hidden knowledge that the apostles aren't telling you, that the Old Testament's not telling you. And we know some things that, you know, Jesus really didn't come in the flesh because flesh is evil. And Jesus really wasn't God. He was just kind of a manifestation of God. And they taught that he was a phantom and they... They taught all kinds of bizarre things. But people flocked to this. Do you, do you remember the Da Vinci Code? The movie, The Da Vinci Code, the book? Okay, I call it The Da Vinci Commode, okay? Uh, when The Da Vinci Code movie came out, okay, yes, you had an uproar with Christians because they were not... They were not uh, going by true history, and they were, there were many false things and dis distortions that happened in the early church. But you also had a bunch of people that were so fascinated by it, 
and so excited about it that they were like jumping on it like it's going to be this new religion. And everybody got fascinated with the Gnostics again. And everybody started talking about the gospel of Thomas and the gospel of Judas. Why anybody would want to follow the gospel of Judas, I have no idea. But that's the deception. And they started getting all excited about this, like there's some conspiracy, there's some mystery. And even the writer of the Da Vinci Commode had to come out and tell people, settle down. This is fiction. Yeah, there's some true things in here, but most of it is fiction. I'm trying to write a book and make some money and make a movie and make some money. And some of you are all upset at me, and the others of you want to turn this into a cult. <laughs> Folks, people, listen, people don't love Jesus, and they don't love the truth of the Bible. That's why they're so fascinated to look for something new. When are you going to give me something new? I remember back, and I forget when the book was written. Some of you might remember The Pur Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren. You might have read that book. It, it, it's got some watered down truth in it. It doesn't say all bad things. But I remember when this book came out and it was a number one bestseller, every, chur every church that I know of in this town was now conducting their Sunday sermons through the purpose driven life. But Freedom Bible didn't do that. Because Freedom Bible stuck to the Bible. I had people mad at me. I had one guy, and I, I thought this guy was a little bit more solid than he was. But he was upset. Why aren't you going through the purpose-driven life like all the other churches? And I said to him, I've got the word of God. Why would I take a book written by a man that's watered down truth and make that my passage on Sunday morning? Are you kidding me? But he couldn't see. And he remained upset at me. And, and this is the thing. People who think they're right are deceived. Sometimes they're not a fool antichrist, but they're misguided at best. And I'm sorry if I'm getting too riled up about this stuff, okay? I'm sorry. I apologize. I keep saying you got to... Not get, you got to stay calm during 1 John because it's, it's already intense. Keep telling myself, but then I get out here and I don't even have all that in my notes. <laughs> Crying out loud. I hope God's doing it. What do we got to do? Stay faithful to what we know from the beginning. Stay faithful to what Jesus taught us. Don't waver from it. And finally, final thing we need to do is stay focused. John says, I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, Abide in him. John's saying to the children of God, to the church, he's saying to us, if you're a genuine believer, he's saying, you don't need worldly wisdom. You don't need something new. You don't need a man to come along and fix the word of God. Okay? Because why? Because you have the anointed one in you. You... You, you have the Holy Spirit. Uh, John 16, 13. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. Jesus saying, the Holy Spirit, you have a spiritual lie detector in you so you can recognize Antichrist. You should be able to recognize false Christ. And you gotta be careful. And that's why you've gotta ground yourself in the word of God or you can be deceived too. Anyone can. And I remember, I remember when I first became a Christian, and I didn't, I didn't care about anything in the religious world. I was into partying. 
So I didn't pay attention to any teacher, religious thing whatsoever, Christian radio. I could care less about it. I wanted to party. But then I came to Christ. So now I came to Christ, and I'm trying to learn and grow in Christ. And all of a sudden, I'm exposed to all these teachings. I've got my church teaching me, and i got the guys discipling me. Thank God they were grounded. But I was turning on Christian radio. I was turning on Christian TV. I was going to the Christian bookstore. And there's just so much stuff. And a lot of it is garbage, absolutely garbage. And I didn't know it at the time. So I was tossed to and fro everywhere with it. And I wanted to know the truth. So I would just pray, God, please show me which guy's right here. This guy says I'm supposed to be speaking in tongues, climbing up on top of the roof. If that's what I'm supposed to do, if I'm supposed to go up on the church roof and speak in tongues, I'll do it. <laughs> but this guy over here says, no, that's, that's, that's not what you're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be reading scripture. And a spirit-filled person is somebody under the control of the Holy Spirit. Well, I'm glad I took that route and stayed off the roof. Okay? But I could go on and on with that. There's so many things back and forth here and there. And the only way I could stay grounded was read the Bible and pray and ask God to show me the truth. And thank God I had good teachers. And then I was able to discern what teachers were teaching the truth and what teachers were misguided and even antichrists. It's all over our world, folks. It's all over Christian television, Christian radio, and people. And that's why I'm worried about you when you don't see it. Because John says you have a spiritual lie detector. You should see it. But I also, I th I'm going to thank, thank God. One of the things, because we've taught through the Bible over the years, we have some strong people in here that recognize lies right away. We have young people in here young people that won't go astray. They are so strong in the word, and we want to continue to do that. John's not saying we don't need teachers. Read Ephesians 4. God gave us the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. But these teachers that God gave us are all teachers teaching what? the word of God. They're not giving you something new. If they're giving you something new, don't listen to them. If, they, if they've given you some conspiracy, don't listen to them. They're lying to you. They are antichrist. Colossians 2.8. We got to close this up. Oh, there's a phone. We almost made it. <laughs> Col Col this is, a good, this is a good verse. That's why that phone's going off. Listen. When your phone goes off, don't be afraid. Turn it off. Okay. I know you're sitting there like, it's my phone, but if I don't look at my phone, he won't think it's my phone. But the phone is still going off, distracting the sermon. Just take your medicine, turn it off. Hey, we're Christians. We got to love you. We got to forgive you. It's all good. Last verse. Last verse. I know it's a long sermon for New Year's. Colossians 2.8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy, human philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, Everything's man-centered, not God-centered. According to the elemental spirits of the world, he's talking about cults, people that get led astray by cults, and not according to Christ. Don't let anybody lead you astray, brothers and sisters. Stay strong in the church. I want to encourage you in 2020, get involved in your church. Be faithful to the church. Be faithful to the word of God. And you'll grow strong. And no antichrist will be able to mess with you. And when Jesus comes, he's going to take you home to be with him. We are going to be talking about
in the coming days in this new year. We, we, the elders have met together and it's on every one of our hearts that we need to do something about church membership. We need to make it more official. We need to see who really belongs and who doesn't. And so we're going to be talking about some of those things. So I hope you belong and, and that you'll never leave us and you're grounded in Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth. God, we live in a world that doesn't believe in truth. They say you can believe whatever you want and you're okay. We know that's a lie of the enemy leading many, many astray. God, as our world changes, as more pressure comes on teaching the truth of Jesus Christ in the only way, help us not to waver. Help us not to be afraid. God, I do pray that you would help us to be Christians that are loving I pray that as we teach that truth, that we are loving to people, even the people that disagree with us, even to antichrists that are really an enemy to you, God, you tell us to love our enemies. So God, help us to try to love them the best we can without compromising and try to bring them to the truth. Thank you, God, that you're a sovereign God. Thank you that your sheep hear your voice and you won't lose one of them. And I pray as your sheep, God, we would grow strong. I pray that our church in 2020 would be stronger than ever. And we thank you that we could come and worship you. Help us to stay faithful. Help us to stay focused. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand. Let's sing together.
Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Come on, Mr. Horses. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no this Saturday, January 4th at 8 a.m. out at Sable Street. Men, come get involved. Uh, it's about an hour long. We eat good, have a little devotion. I'd love to meet you if I haven't met you there. Come to the men's breakfast. Uh, there's a men's Bible study also starting on Habakkuk, uh, January 7th at 6.30 p.m. That's going to be on Tuesday nights out at Sable Street. Hope you get involved in that. Let me pray for you and let you go. God, thank you for today. God, I pray that you would go with these dear people, your children, your sheep. Guide them into all truth, God. Bless them for being here today to worship you and hear your word. Um, God, now go with them and bless them. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>